a short excerpt from chapter 2 of The Nature of the Gods by Cicero. So, there is a general agreement among all persons of every nation. All have an innate conviction that gods exist, for it is, so to say, engraved on their hearts. No one denies that they exist, though there is a range of opinions about their nature. Cleanthes of our school stated that there are four reasons why conceptions of the gods are imprinted on human minds. The first which he posited was the one which I have just mentioned, arising out of foreknowledge of future events. The second we infer from the abundant blessings derived from our temperate climate, the fertility of our lands, and a host of other advantages. The third is the terror experienced by our minds through lightning, storms, rain clouds, snows, hailstones, desolation, plague, earthquakes, and also through frequent rumblings, showers of stone and drops of blood, landslides, sudden chasms, unnatural prodigies both human and bestial, the sightings of shooting stars and those which the Greek call comets and we term long-haired stars. Only recently these last presaged great disasters in the war which Octavius raised. Then too there is the phenomenon of twin suns. My father told me that this occurred in the consulship of Tudetanos and Aquilius, the year in which the light of Publius Africanus, Rome's second son, was extinguished. These manifestations caused people to panic and to suspect the existence of some heavenly and divine power. The fourth reason advanced, and the greatest, is the uniform movement and undeviating rotation of the heavens, the individuality, usefulness, beauty and order of the sun and moon and stars, the very sight of which is sufficient proof that they are not the outcome of chance. Supposing a person enters a house or athletic centre or market and observes the systematic and ordered arrangement of everything there, he could not conclude that this was accidental. He would realise that there was someone in charge exacting obedience. When the person observes the large-scale movements and alternations in the heavens, the ordered patterning of those massive bodies from which earliest ages have never in their infinite and boundless existence proved unfaithful, he must all the more come to the view that these mighty movements of nature are controlled by some mind. Though Chrysippus has the sharpest of minds, what he says about this he seems to have learnt from nature herself and not to have fathomed it in his own mind. If there is anything in the universe, he says, which man's mind and reason and his human thrust and capacity cannot achieve, that which creates it is inevitably superior to man. Now the heavenly bodies and all those objects whose orderly progression is never-ending cannot be created by man. Therefore, that by which they are created is superior to man. And what better name can be ascribed to this than God? Indeed, if gods do not exist, there can surely be nothing in creation better than man, for he alone possesses reason, which no other faculty excels. But that a man should exist believing that nothing in this universe is superior to himself would be insanely arrogant. Therefore, something superior does exist, so God certainly exists. Supposing your eyes lit upon a large and beautiful house, even if you could not descry its owner, no one could force you to believe that it was built by mice and weasels. Well then, if you were to imagine that the highly adorned universe, with its huge variety and beauty of the heavenly bodies, was your home and not that of the immortal gods, would you not seem to be totally out of your mind? Another thing, can we not grasp that all things which are higher are better? and that the earth is the lowest level of all, shrouded in an impenetrable band of air? For this reason, the experience which is visited upon certain regions and cities of having inhabitants who are dimmer-witted because of the denser atmosphere has also afflicted the human race, because it is located on earth, the densest region of the universe. 
in spite of this mental limitation, our native intelligence must lead to the view that there is a mind certainly keener than our own and also divine. As Socrates asks in the pages of Xenophon, where did man lay hold of the intelligence which he possesses? If someone seeks to know the source of the moisture and the heat circulating in our bodies and the earthly solidity of our flesh and lastly the breath that animates us, the answer of course is clear. One of these we have obtained from the earth, another from water, a third from fire, and the fourth, which we call our breath, from the lower air. But where did we light upon and obtain the faculty which transcends all these? I refer to the reason, or, if you wish to express it more fully, the mental processes of deliberation, reflection and forethought. Are we to say that the universe possesses all the rest, but not the one thing which is of the greatest value? Yet, beyond all doubt, no existing thing is better, more outstanding or more beautiful than the universe. Indeed, not only is there nothing better, but there is nothing conceivably better. Now, if there is nothing better than reason and wisdom, these qualities must exist in that which we concede is best of all. Consider again the harmony, unanimity, and unbroken affinity in nature. This will surely compel one and all to express agreement with my case. How could the earth at one time blossom, but then in turn become rigidly barren? How could the approach and departure of the sun at the summer and winter solstices be signalled by a spontaneous transformation in so much of nature? How could the sea tides and the confined waters in the straits be <coughs> affected by the rising and setting of the moon, or the diverse courses of the stars being maintained in a single rotation of the entire heavens? What is certain is that these processes could not take place through harmonious activity in all parts of the universe unless they were each embraced by a single, divine, all-pervading spiritual force. When these arguments are propounded in a richer and more flowing style, as I intend to present them, they more easily escape the captious criticism of the academics. But when they are expressed more briefly and sparingly, as Zeno used to do, they are more exposed to rebuttal. A river in spate suffers little or no pollution, whereas an enclosed pool gets easily sullied. And likewise, the critic's censure is diluted by a stream of eloquence, whereas the narrow confines of circumscribed arguments cannot readily defend themselves. These expansive arguments of ours were condensed by Zeno like this. That which employs reason is better than that which does not. Now, nothing is superior to the universe, therefore the universe employs reason. Well, by a similar argument it can be established that the universe is wise and blessed and eternal, for all embodiments of these attributes are superior to those without them, and nothing is superior to the universe. This will lead to the conclusion that the universe is God. Well, Zeno also produced this argument. Nothing which is devoid of sensation can contain anything which possesses sensation. Now, some parts of the universe possess sensation. Therefore, the universe is not devoid of sensation. Well, he goes further, pressing the argument more closely. Nothing which lacks a vital spirit and reason can bring forth from itself a being endowed with both life and reason. Now the universe does bring forth creatures endowed with life and reason. Therefore, the universe is endowed with life and reason. He also pressed home his argument with his favourite technique of the simile, like this. If flutes playing tunefully were sprouting on an olive tree, you would surely have no doubt that the olive tree had the knowledge of flute playing. Again, if plane trees bore lutes playing in tune, you would likewise, I suppose, judge that plane trees were masters of the art of music. Well, why then is the universe not accounted animate and wise, 
when it brings forth from itself creatures which are animate and wise. Well, earlier I stated that this, the first of my four topics, needed no elaboration because it was crystal clear to everyone that gods exist. But as I have begun to ignore that initial declaration, I should now like to ram home this very point with arguments drawn from physics, that is, the world of nature. The simple fact is that all things which are nourished and grow contain within themselves the thermal energy without which they could not be nourished or grow, for everything which is hot and fiery is stirred and driven by its own movement. Now, that which is nourished and grows experiences movement which is steady and uniform, and as long as this movement remains within us, we retain sensation and life. But once that heat cools and dies, we ourselves decline and are snuffed out. Cleanthes deploys further arguments to demonstrate the degree of thermal heat in every body. He states that no food is so solid as to not be digestible within a day and a night, and some heat still remains even in the residue which nature expels. Then again now, veins and arteries never cease to throb with the sensation of fiery movement, and has often been observed when the heart has been plucked out of a living creature it pulsates with such rapid movement as to resemble a flickering flame. Therefore, every living being, be it animal or vegetable, lives because of the heat enclosed within it. This forces us to the conclusion that the elemental heat possesses within it a life-sustaining force which extends through the whole universe. We shall visualize this more readily if we explain ourselves, if we explain more precisely this entire element of fire which pervades all matter. All parts of the universe then, but I shall specify only the largest, are supported and sustained by heat. This can be observed first of all in the element of earth, so we see fire ignited by striking or rubbing stones together, or again earth when freshly dug steams with heat. Then too, water drawn from well springs is hot, especially in winter time, because a great concentration of heat is contained in subterranean caves, and since the earth gets denser in winter, it compresses more closely the heat stored within it. It would need a lengthy discourse with a host of arguments to succeed in demonstrating that all the seeds which the earth harbours in her womb, and the plants which she herself spontaneously generates and take root in her, owe their origin and their growth due to the uh, growth to the due proportion of heat within her. As for water, the very fact of its fluidity demonstrates that heat mingles with it as well. It would not freeze over in cold weather, nor harden into cold or frost, unless it is also melted, thawed and liquefied through the intermingling of heat. So the moisture both solidifies when cold winds from the north or other quarters impinge upon it and in turn it softens when warmed, and it melts with the heat. The seas too, when stirred with winds, become warm, and we can readily conclude that, this, that from this that heat is stored within those massive waters. We are not to imagine that the warmth enters from outside, rather it is stirred up by violent movement from the innermost depths of the sea. A similar thing happens to our own bodies, through movement and exertion they become warm. As for lower air, which is by nature the coldest of the elements, it is certainly not devoid of heat. Indeed there is a great deal of it intermingling within, for the air itself becomes, uh, comes into being by exhalation from the waters. In fact we are to regard the air as a kind of vaporised water. The vapour emerges through the action of the heat resident in the water. We can observe a similar development when water comes to the boil through resting on the fire below it. The fourth and remaining element in the universe is by nature wholly composed of fire, which bestows its health-giving, animating heat on all the other elements. The conclusion we infer from this is that, since all parts of the universe are sustained by heat, it is the same element, or its equivalent, which likewise keeps the universe itself in being 
throughout the long ages. And all the more so because we are to realise that this hot, fiery substance percolates the whole of nature in such a way that it becomes both the forceful begetter and the cause of bringing into existence the means of which all living creatures and the plants rooted in the earth are to be brought to birth and nurtured. So there is an element which holds together and protects the entire universe, an element moreover not devoid of sensation and reason, for every organism in nature provided that it does not stand alone and is not a single substance but is complex and composite must have within it some ruling principle. In man this is the mind, and in beasts something similar to the mind, which awakens their inclination for things. In the case of trees and of plants which spring from the earth, the ruling principle is thought to reside in their roots. I use the term ruling principle, principatus, for what the Greeks call hegemonicon. There is nothing in each and every class of object which can or should overshadow it. From this it must follow that the element containing the ruling principle in the whole of nature is the best of all things, and is supremely worthy of power and dominion over the whole universe. Well now we observe that some parts of the universe possess sensation and reason. I say parts of the universe for there is nothing in its entirety which is not a part of the whole. It must accordingly follow that those faculties exist in the part wherein the ruling principle of the universe resides, and indeed that they are keener and greater there. The universe itself must accordingly be wise, and the element which embraces and secures the whole of reality must be supremely endowed with perfect reason. So the universe must be God, and its entire energy must lie in that element which is divine. Moreover, the fiery heat of the universe is much purer, more radiant and more supple, and accordingly better adapted to stimulate our senses than is that heat which we ourselves experience, and which is the agent by which objects known to us are kept in being and nurtured. So, since humans and beasts are controlled by this heat of ours, and are thereby enabled to experience movement and feeling, it would be nonsense to claim that the universe lacks sensation, for the heat which controls it is undiminished, free-ranging, pure, and in addition, supremely keen and mobile. What reinforces this contention is that this heat within the universe is not engendered by any foreign force from outside, but is spontaneously moved by its own efforts. For what force can exist more powerful than the universe, or is capable of lending impetus and movement to the heat by which the universe is preserved in being? Here we lend an ear to Plato, the god, so to say, among philosophers. His view is that motion is of two kinds, the first self-propelled, and the second directed from without, and that which is achieved spontaneously of its own accord is more divine than that awakened by the thrust of another. Spontaneous motion he attributes only to souls. In his view it is from them that all motion takes its rise. So, since all motion has its origin in the heat within the universe, and since such heat is a achieved spontaneously, and not by an external thrust, that fiery heat must be a living soul. In other words, the universe is alive. A further consideration will enable us to realise that the universe possesses understanding. The universe is certainly better than any individual element, just as there is no part of our own bodies which is not of lesser account than our full selves. So the entire universe must be of greater importance than any part of the whole. If this is accepted, the universe must be wise, for if it were not, we would have to say that a human being, though a part of the universe, is of greater worth than the entire universe because he has a share of reason. A further argument. If we seek to move forward from the first undeveloped levels of being to the furthest and most perfect, 
we inevitably arrive at the nature of the gods. At the lowest level we observe that nature sustains plants sprung from her earth, we, and she bestows on them nothing more than her protective nurture and growth. On beasts she has conferred feeling and movement, and a kind of inclination which prompts them to seek what is good for them and avoid what is baneful. On humans she bestowed something more noble than this, with the additional gift of reason, to enable them to control their mental inclinations, giving them free reign at one time and holding them in check at another. But the fourth and highest level is of beings who by nature are begotten good and wise. From the outset there is implanted in them the reason which is steady and true. We must visualise this as beyond the reach of the human race and assign it to God, that is, to the universe in which the total perfection of reason must reside. Furthermore, it's undeniable that in each and every compartment of life there is some ultimate perfection. Take as examples the vine and cattle. Unless it meets some obstructive force, nature follows its own route to reach its final perfection. Or again, the arts of painting, architecture and the other crafts seek their goal of consummate workmanship. Similarly, and indeed to a much greater degree, the entire realm of nature is the scene of such achievement and perfection, though the individual facets of nature can encounter many actual obstacles to impede their perfection, nothing can hinder the progress of nature as a whole, since she constrains and contains all those facets within herself. And this is why the fourth level, which is highest of all, must exist, so that no external force can approach it. This is the level on which the nature of the universe rests, and since it both presides over all things and cannot be hindered by any of them, the universe must be both intelligent and indeed also wise. Well, what greater mark of ignorance can there be than to refuse to grant the title of best to the nature which embraces all things? Or, if conceding that it is best, to deny first of all that it is alive, second that it is endowed with reason and purpose, and finally that it is wise. For how else can it possibly be best? If it is comparable to plants or even to the brute beasts, one cannot regard it as best rather than worst. Even if it had a share of reason, but had not been wise from the outset, the status of the universe would clearly be worse than that of human beings, for a man can become wise, whereas the universe assuredly will never attain wisdom if it has lacked it throughout the eternity of the past. So it would be inferior to man. But since this is absurd, the universe must be accounted as having been wise and divine from the very beginning. The universe alone has no deficiencies. It is compacted closely together, and it is perfect and complete in all its aspects and parts. Chrysippus puts it neatly when he says that just as the cover is made for the shield, and the sheath for a sword, so all things with the exception of the universe have been created for other things. So cereals and fruits of the earth grow for the benefit of living creatures, and animals exist to meet men's needs, the horses mount, the ox for ploughing, the dog for hunting and guard duty. Man has emerged for the contemplation and imitation of the universe. Though he is in no way perfect, in a sense he is a fragment of perfection. By contrast, the universe is perfect in every aspect, for it incorporates all things, and nothing exists which does not lie within it. Or how then can it be devoid of what is best, and since nothing is better than intelligence and reason, the universe cannot lack these? Chrysippus appends analogies to make his point well. He states that all things improve in creatures which have attained the perfection of full growth, so they are better in a horse than in a foal, in a dog than in a pup, and in a man than in a boy. Hence, that which is best in the universe as a whole must reside in what is perfect and complete. Now, nothing is more perfect than the universe, 
and nothing is better than excellence, so excellence rightly belongs to the universe. Man's nature is not perfect, yet man achieves excellence. Well, how much more readily then does the universe achieve it? So the universe possesses excellence, and is therefore wise, and in consequence, divine. Once we have recognised that the universe possesses this divinity, we must assign that same divinity to the stars, for they are sprung from the most fluid and pure sector, which is the ether, with no admixture of any other element. They are entirely translucent heat, so that the perfect truth we can say that they too are living beings with sensation and understanding. That the heavenly bodies are composed wholly of fire, Cleanthes believes is confirmed by the evidence of two of our sources, those of touch and sight, for the sun's heat and brightness are more brilliant than those of any fire, since it shines so far and wide over the boundless universe, and its impact is so powerful that it not merely warms, but also often burns. Neither of these effects could it achieve if it were not made of fire. Therefore, says Cleanthes, since the sun is made of fire and is nurtured by moisture from the ocean, and no fire could continue to burn without some form of nourishment, it must be like the fire which we exploit for our own use and sustenance, or like that which is contained in the bodies of living creatures. But whereas the fire which we need for daily living destroys and consumes everything, and causes chaos and scatters everything in its hostile path, the heat in our bodies is life-enhancing and health-giving. It preserves, nurtures, increases and sustains all things, and endows them with feeling. He therefore concludes that there is no doubt which of these fires the sun resembles, since it too ensures that all things blossom and ripen, each according to its kind. So, since the sun's fire is similar to the fires which inhere in the bodies of living creatures, the sun too must be alive, and likewise the other celestial bodies, for they are sprung from that heat of the heavens which we call the ether, or the sky. Well, since then, some forms of life have come into existence on earth, others in water, and others still in the lower air, Aristotle regards it as nonsensical to think that no living being is born in the region best adapted for begetting living things. Now, the region of the ether is occupied by the stars, and since it is largely rarefied and constantly shifting and active, any living being begotten in it any living being begotten in it must have the keenest of senses and the swiftest of movements. So, since the stars have their origin in the ether, the logical inference is that they possess feeling and understanding, which is why the stars must be numbered among the gods. We observe, do we not, that those who dwell in lands where the atmosphere is clear and rarefied have minds that are sharper and more intelligent than those whose climate is thick and cloying. Then, too, the general belief persists that the relative sharpness of our minds depends on what we eat. On these grounds, it is probable that the stars have surpassing intelligence, for on the one hand, the sector of the universe in which they dwell is the ether, and on the other, the vapours from seas and lands which sustain them are rarefied by the huge distance which they travel. What especially denotes that the stars are conscious and intelligent as their consistent regularity in the absence of random or fortuitous variation. For such rational, ordered movement can be conducted, for no such can rational, ordered movement can be conducted without planning. Now this systematic regularity of the stars through all eternity is an indication of no mere natural process, for it is wholly rational. Nor is the operation of chance, which loves change and abhors consistency, so it follows that the movement is self-induced, brought about by their own consciousness and divinity. We must praise Aristotle also for his doctrine that the movement of all objects is to be ascribed to nature, or force, or will. In stating that the sun, moon, and all the heavenly bodies are moved, he observes that things moved by nature are born either downward by their weight or upward by their lightness. 
but that neither of these applies to the stars because their progress is circular. Again, it can hardly be suggested that the stars are moved by the impact of some greater force opposed to their own nature, for what greater force can there be? So the only possibility remaining is that their movement is voluntary. The person who observes these facts would display not merely ignorance, but also impiety if he said that the gods do not exist. And there is very, very little difference between denying that they exist and depriving them of any stewardship or activity. For, in my eyes, a person who is not active seems not to exist at all. To sum up, the existence of the gods is so crystal clear that I regard anyone who denies it as being virtually out of his mind. My retain, remaining task is to consider what the gods are like. Now, it is supremely difficult to detach our inward vision from the usual testimony of our bodily eyes. This difficulty makes the naive public, and philosophers similarly naive, unable to visualise the immortal gods without forming them in human shape. This shallow-mindedness has already been censured by Cotter and needs no further words from me. But in our minds we hold the sure conviction first that God is a living being, and second that nothing surpasses him in the whole of nature, and in my view nothing so aptly accords with, the, with these preconceived convictions as the conclusion that the universe first and foremost is alive and divine, for nothing more outstanding can exist.